Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith. In this video, we're going to be learning the two to four player game Mechs vs. Minions designed and published by Riot Games. Here you'll be taking on the role of young mech pilots undergoing extensive training. Unfortunately, your headmaster thinks the best way for you to learn is by putting you in peril, so you'll have to work together to save your school both from the approaching minion horde and your professor's questionable guidance. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. Mechs vs. Minions is made up of a series of adventures you'll play one after the other, creating a larger campaign. Most of these are found in sealed envelopes that you'll unlock as you go, but this all starts with a tutorial scenario, which is what we're going to learn in this video, as this will introduce us to all of the game's fundamental rules. The game comes with several double-sided map tiles that you'll use to build the scenario, but for the tutorial mission, you'll just need this one, which you place in the center of the play area. We're then told to put this tile on top, which represents the mech school, and then we place out these pieces known as crystal shards. This is the crystal compass, which you also place nearby, oriented in the direction as shown here in the scenario. So in this case, the red crystal should be pointing up. Now each player claims one of these four pre-painted Yordle miniatures. This will represent you and the mech that you're piloting. And in this video, we're gonna set up for three players. So we'll return Corky to the box. Now collect your matching command line, which shows your pilot's portrait here in the upper left-hand corner. The mechs are then placed as you like on any of these four spaces, as indicated by the scenario. So players can talk together to decide where they want to go, and you can face your mech in any one of the four directions, up, down, left, or right. This is the command card deck, which you should shuffle and then place face down nearby, along with the rune and number dice. Next, assign each player to one of the four colors found on the crystal compass, and then roll one of these rune dice until one of the player's colors are rolled. They'll be the first player and are given Zonia's Minute Glass as a reminder. The game comes with loads of other components, but these you should leave in the box for now, particularly this secret box and these sealed dossiers, neither of which should ever be opened until you're instructed. And that's the setup. In Mechs vs. Minions, players will be working together to try to complete the objective presented by a scenario. At the start of each game, your mech won't be able to do very much at all, but over time, you'll be able to add to its capabilities and pretty soon you'll have a lean, mean fighting machine. Unless you take too much damage and then you'll just be piloting a rusty old clunker. <laughs> the game is played over a series of rounds broken into phases. But to get started, we only have to learn the player phase, which is broken into three steps, starting with drafting command cards. Here, the first player deals five command cards into a face-up row from this deck and then picks any one of them to collect. Each of these have special abilities that will affect how your mech functions in the game, and we'll learn more about those powers a little bit later. For now, continue in clockwise order with each player picking a command card until a total of four have been taken. This is always true, no matter the number of players. So if you have four players, each will get one. But if you have less than four, like we do here, you keep going around again, meaning that some players will end up with extra commands, and that's okay. The leftover command is then placed in a shared command discard pile. Now it's the play command card step. Here, players simultaneously choose where on their command line to place all of the cards they've just collected. After this phase, your mech will activate and you resolve all the cards in your command line from left to right. So as you place, you're going to want to be thinking ahead, not just for how this will affect your mech now, but also in future turns as you gain more commands and add them to your line. So let's go over a few key rules. First of all, you cannot save cards for later. Any you gained must be used. Also, when a command is slotted, it will stay there unless otherwise adjusted by an effect. That said, during this step, you can place them in any order you want and you can leave spaces between commands to give flexibility for how you might change the programming of your mech later. One thing you'll notice is that each of the commands are represented by a unique color and element. Red, which is fire, yellow for electric, blue for metal, and green for computery. Yep, I said computery. When placing commands, you can stack new ones on top of older ones if they share the same element. But you can only place on top, not under. And the one on top is known as the active command. Ensure that you can always see how many are in a stack by overlapping them like this, because as we'll see later, combining commands makes the one on top even more powerful. That said, at most, you can have no more than three commands in a single stack. So if you would add a fourth one, then you have to discard the one that's on the bottom. Now that said, you are allowed to place a command with a different element on top of a previously programmed slot. 
But if you do that, all the old ones must be discarded first. So those are the rules for programming. And again, players do this at the same time, but they can freely talk amongst themselves as they're making their choices before they lock things in. But then, once everyone's ready, it's time to move on to the next step, executing command lines. Starting with the first player, they will now execute their entire command line from slot one through six in that order, following the directions on every card, skipping over any empty slots. The key here is that all commands must be followed, even if they would activate your mech in unfavorable ways. Once the first player is done, then the next player in clockwise order executes their command line, and so on until everyone has had a turn. But let's stop here and learn how to read the abilities found on these commands by looking at a couple of examples. First of all, there are 12 different commands divided into three main types, moves, turns, and attacks which you can identify generally by the symbols found here. And within each of these categories, there's a unique one for each of the element types. Now, I'm not gonna go over all of the effects for each of these, as they're described on the cards themselves. But to give us a good sense of how they work, let's look at one example from each category. This is Scythe. Its basic effect is that your mech must turn 90 degrees, and then it can assign one damage to a target within one range. This little explosive symbol here represents one point of damage and a range of one is every square surrounding your mech as you're reminded of here. Crystal shards in the tutorial scenario are destroyed when they take even just one point of damage. So Ziggs here, executing this command, would first have to turn 90 degrees, and the player can choose to turn to either side. And then they can assign one point of damage to one target within one range. So they could destroy either one of these crystals, removing them from the board. However, if we had another metal element underneath of Scythe, its secondary power would instead resolve. And this says the player can choose to turn either 90 or 180 degrees, and then choose two targets to assign one damage to within one range. So now executing this one command means they could destroy both of these crystals. Just keep in mind, once a command has been upgraded, you must execute its current effect. You can't go back to a lesser one. And finally, at the third level, you can now rotate your mech in any direction and then pick up to three targets to assign one damage. Do keep in mind though, when rotating, you cannot point diagonally. Here's an example of a move command. Omni Stomp lets you move one space forward or to either side without changing direction. And when leveled up, you can go even more spaces, but they must always be in the same direction. Movement follows some general rules. First of all, a mech cannot leave the board, so any movement on a command that would cause it to leave instead stops it at the edge and the rest is ignored. Also, mechs will push each other if they would enter a space with one and there's an empty space behind it. Let's say, for example, Ziggs was here and want to go in this direction. If executing this command, it says he'll move three spaces, so he would push Tristana two spaces in this direction and then have to stop because they can't go any further. As we'll learn in this scenario, crystal shards also break if a mech moves into a space with one, which then removes it from the board. Finally, we have attack commands. This one is chain lightning, and when it resolves, it does one damage to any one target you choose within these three spaces on the front edge of your mech. Then, if a minion dies as a result, you can chain one additional damage to another target diagonally adjacent to the first one. I should point out, although it says, if a minion dies, this could also include a destroyed shard. We haven't seen minions yet, but I've put a few here on the board. Like crystal shards, they die when they suffer one damage. So if Ziggs used chain lightning in this case, because he's facing in this direction, he could target either of these three spaces with his first point of damage. Let's say he chooses the crystal shard here. And then, since this is an enemy that's diagonally adjacent to the original target, he could hit this one as well. As chain lightning powers up, you'll be able to hit more and more targets using this chain lightning effect. Executing this upgraded command, Ziggs could now target this crystal, then chain lightning to this minion, then this one, and this one as well. The rest of the command cards I'll let you discover on your own, though you'll find them all outlined here on the back of this included reference. And that's the player phase. You first put out five command cards and have each player take one, going in clockwise order until a total of four have been collected. Then these are placed, and again, in turn order, each player will execute their command lines, and then the round is over. At the end of a round, the player with the first player marker should pass that to the person on their left, and then you repeat a new round and keep doing this until the objective is completed. 
And that's everything you need to know to start playing. So let's go to the table and find out what the objective is for this scenario. Rumble the Headmaster wants you to test the new mechs that you've just built by smashing each of the four crystal shards that he's laid out. These will be destroyed if you do at least one damage to them with an attack or by stomping on them, which just means that you move or are pushed into their spaces. So pause the video, get to work, and come back once the crystals have been destroyed, or keep watching to learn more about what comes next. Some scenarios show a red band like this, meaning that things will escalate once you've completed your objective, which we'll pretend has happened right now. Turns out using volatile crystal shards as target practice was not a good idea, and we've attracted the attention of evil minions led by some unknown master. So we're now told to locate the minion figures, and the game comes with loads of them. This is just some, and you'll certainly need a lot more in the later scenarios, but for now we'll pull a few of these out. The minions show different poses, but these are for variety. They have no effect on the gameplay itself, so pick out any ones that you want. Using the diagram that you see on screen, which is taken from the tutorial scenario, you'll now place minions in the indicated spaces, unless that space is already filled with something else, like one of the mechs. For example, a minion's supposed to go in this space, but Ziggs is already here, so this one we can just return to the box. Next, locate this damage deck, shuffle it, and put it in a face-down pile nearby. Turns out those crystals we stomped all exploded, and starting with the first player and going clockwise, one at a time, each will draw one damage card and fully resolve its instructions. No matter how much damage you take, you can never be eliminated from the game, but it can mess up your mech. So let's go to the table and I'll show you an example of each of the three different types of damage that you can receive. This symbol represents glitch damage. You simply resolve the effect here and then discard it to a shared damage discard pile. This effect tells us that we need to swap the commands we have in slots 3 and 4. This symbol represents system damage, and the damage deck won't actually start with any of these in it. Where do they come from? I'll never tell, but I have obscured the effect so you can wait and find out for yourself. However, when you draw one of these, you simply place it near your command line and keep it there to remind you of an ongoing effect. If you see this symbol in the upper right hand corner, you've received slot damage. First, you resolve the effect here, which tells us to move one space to the left. So let's say this was affecting Ziggs. We'd put him here, and then you roll the number die. And whichever number you roll represents the slot where this damage will now be placed. You'll notice you put it on top of any command cards already there, and if that slot was already damaged, you discard the old damage first and then replace it with this new one. From now on, whenever you execute your command line, you'll resolve any damage effect as if it was a command, ignoring the actual commands underneath. And you don't need to roll a die for it anymore, it will now stay in this slot. You also can't place new commands into damaged slots, but don't worry, we'll learn how to repair damage soon enough. First though, let's learn more about these pesky minions. From now on, and for the rest of the games you play, you'll perform a minion phase after the player phase, which is also broken into three steps, starting with minion movement. Each mission gives you instructions for any unique behaviors the minions may have, and in this case, we're told to roll a rune die. Then we move all minions one space in the direction showing on the compass that matches the color rolled. So in this case, they'll be moving in this direction. Keep in mind, minions can never move into an occupied space, which means they can never push other minions or mechs, and they can't move off the board. This means these two minions can't move because they're blocked by zigs, and this one's blocked by the edge of the board. After moving, new minions typically spawn as explained by the scenario, but not for this one, so we'll skip that step and learn about that in the next video. Finally, minions attack. In this step, starting with the first player, they count the number of minions adjacent to them, but not diagonally. In this case, Heimerdinger has one minion adjacent. You now draw and fully resolve, one at a time, a damage card for each. When that player is done, the next player checks for and resolves damage, and so on. There are a couple of exceptions to this. First, if you have a fuel tank in the top position of one of your command slots, before taking damage, you have the option of exploding it, discarding all the cards in that slot, and then dealing one damage to all the spaces within its reach based on how leveled up it was. Minions killed by this effect will no longer be able to do their damage to the targeted mech, which also saves other mechs from taking damage from them as well. After checking that, another exception is this skewer command. You'll notice it says, when you stomp on a minion from its movement, you may place the minion on the card itself. At most it can hold one, but now if you would take damage, you may instead discard the minion there to prevent a single damage you would normally take. 
If you don't have or don't use the fuel tank or the skewer effect, then you just resolve damage as normal. But now, to further help you along, let's learn how to repair your mechs from the damage they're going to start taking. From now on, during the draft step, command cards that you pick up can be scrapped, which means you discard them in place of adding them to your command line. If they have the metal or fire symbol, then as indicated here, at the very bottom, you can repair one damage by discarding it from your command line. This also means any revealed command cards underneath are now active again. If you discard a computery or electric card, it will allow you to swap any two undamaged slots, which can be handy if you need to reprogram your mech during the game. With that, you're now ready to tackle the rest of this scenario, playing full rounds. And remember, the game comes with this handy sheet to remind you of the different steps as you're learning. When you've destroyed all the minions, the tutorial is finished, and then you can read this congratulation paragraph here and follow the directions to start the first mission labeled as Operation Short Fuse, and that's located in this sealed dossier. And that's everything you need to know to play the tutorial scenario for Mechs vs. Minions. But if you're looking in your box and you're thinking, what are all these other components for? Rodney, like, what's this? <laughs> or how do I play all those other scenarios? Well, don't worry, in the description of this video, you'll find links to all the other videos where I talk about everything else this game has to offer. And if you have any questions about anything that you saw here, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.